Good Wednesday evening, Temple Church. We just want y'all to know that throughout this message, you're going to hear this phone ring 27 times in a row. <laughs> and we make it, we are purposeful in shutting off all the phones that we can, except for the big 1930 phone right next to us. <laughs> we love you guys. Enjoy the message. God bless you. Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening service. We're so glad that you have joined us tonight. We are going to continue what we started a few weeks ago in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. However, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Because of COVID running rampant, it seems like all over the place, we have been online only on Sundays for the last few weeks. That will continue this coming Sunday as well. So please keep that in mind. Please continue to keep one another in your prayers. And hopefully in the next few weeks, we will all be able to get back together in our worship service. In Acts chapter 5, we looked a few weeks ago at Ananias and Sapphira and how that they had made a promise to the Holy Spirit, promise to the Lord, and went back on the promise and how the Lord just killed them both like that. Aren't you glad tonight that God doesn't wipe us out every time we sin against him? We saw a few weeks ago the powerful atmosphere that was in the church. Tonight we will pick up with Acts chapter 5 and verse 17. And you're also going to see an unsuccessful attack that was made upon the church. This attack comes from the religious leaders. You would think these guys would be the ones that would keep things in order. They're trying to keep it in order according to their order, not God's order. So what do these religious leaders do? They take the apostles, according to verse 18 of chapter 5, they put them in prison again. And God does another miracle. In verse 19 of chapter 5, the angel of the Lord comes, opens the prison doors, and says in verse 19, tells them, go and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. They just got through being thrown in jail because of teaching and preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Lord opens the jail and says, go back and keep on doing what you were doing. But the next morning, the high priest, the religious leaders, send guards to get the apostles. They find that the jail is empty. Verse 17, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, they were filled with indignation. They were filled with, with jealousy. Now we know that the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit. The prison now was empty. Think about it. Here these religious leaders were, so pompous, so pious, and they wouldn't even answer the telephone. They thought that they had everyone for Jesus locked up. But God has released them. You go to verse 26. They tell the officers to go over there and bring them back. But be careful how you do it. They did not want to cause an uproar. Did not want to cause an uprising. In verse 27. They bring the apostles back in front of a council for yet another meeting. They say now in verse 28, Did not we straightly or strictly command you that ye should not teach in his name? And behold, ye have filled Jesus with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, according to these leaders or religious leaders, this was a complaint. However, even today, the Lord has a way of sometimes taking complaints and turning them into compliments. This is really one of the greatest compliments the church has ever had. For you see, they said, you guys have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. That's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ had told them to do. You go back to Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, where the Bible says, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you are going to be witnesses for me in Jerusalem. 
Fast forward over 2,000 years. Believers today are still told to do the same. We have the same responsibility today to go out and tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 32 tells us how they did it. The apostles say, and, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to them that obey him. Today as well, that's how you get the message to everyone in your neighborhood. That's how you get the message to everyone in your city. You and I are to be witnesses. Yes, to live our life, but also to use our mouth. We are the Lord's mouthpiece today to tell other people about Jesus. I love how these witnesses responded to the attack on the church. You go back to chapter 5 and verse 20. Here is the commission. Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. That's exactly what they did. They gave a constant, consistent witness. Because once again, Jesus Christ has said, go and make disciples. The New Testament is filled with different commands for believers to go. And even today, we have to go to where the people are. We have to give a consistent witness. We have to give a courageous witness. Sometimes it's going to take some courage, some boldness to tell folks about Jesus Christ. You go back to verse 9 of chapter 5. Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Peter had found that the bottom line of the Christian life, and that is to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in reality, if Christ is Lord of your life, then obedience is really academic. We ought to obey God rather than man. That will simplify your Christian life a lot. Just make up your mind to obey God. Even in this pandemic, we can still obey God. We can still tell other people who are searching. We can still tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 30 and 31, you have what we call a, a Christ-centered witness. For the Bible says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew or whom ye killed, and hung on a tree. Him has God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Same story. Same message. Never gets old. Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried in a tomb. Three days later, he rose again. What a message. What a story. What a gospel we have to preach tonight. Jesus died on the cross for my sins and yours. But then we see some questionable advice concerning the church. Verse 33. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. But they took counsel to kill them or to slay them. They said, hey, we've heard enough of these guys. We're just going to kill them. And now help comes from an unexpected source in verse 34. Then stood up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law had a reputation, a good reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. What's that talking about? Who is Gamaliel? He was one of the great leaders of the Jewish people at this time. He was a Pharisee. He was a doctor of the law. Now, that does not mean that he was a lawyer. It just means that he was an expert in Old Testament scriptures. He was a man that had a tremendous reputation. We're told in Acts chapter 22 and verse 3 that Paul was a student of this man Gamaliel. Some think Paul was destined to have been his successor. 
He was loved by the people. He had a tremendous amount of influence. What he does here is amazing. He's able to calm the council and keep the apostles from being killed. He's able to reverse the situation here with them. He says in verse 35, Ye men of Israel, as you can't tell, we are having trouble with the phones today. But he says in verse 35, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men, or be careful of the decisions that you're getting ready to make. He's saying, let's just kind of step back a little bit. Let's chill out a little bit. Let things calm down for a little bit. Then Gamaliel gives this counsel in verse 36, the next few verses. He says, For before those days rose up, Thotis, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men would be Messiah, about 400 of them, joined themselves who was slain. And all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered. Nothing happened. After this rose up Judas of Galilee, another would-be Messiah in the days of the taxing. And he drew away much people after him. But he also died. And all, even as many as obeyed him, they were scattered as well. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men. Let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you're not going to be able to over, over, overthrow it because you cannot fight against God. If a movement is of God, you're not going to be able to destroy it. If something is not of God, eventually it will come to naught. It will die out. Now, hang on to this, because the counsel that Gamaliel is giving, when you examine it a little bit closer, you'll find that it has enough truth to be persuasive, but enough error to be dangerous. Gamaliel is nothing less than an appeaser right here. He's saying, let's just be neutral in this manner of Jesus in the church. I want to suggest to you this evening, that this is doubtful advice. You say, why? Well, we see he makes a false comparison. What has he done here? He has compared Jesus to these other two guys that we know nothing about. He has literally brought Jesus down to the level of just another rebel, just another man, just another, another revolutionary. And we see it as well today. People try to pull Jesus down to the level of men. In many articles, we find Jesus is just another man. In TV shows, some of them, Jesus is just another religious person. In songs, he's, he's just a superstar. In many dramas, he's just another person in history. I tell you tonight, Jesus Christ is not just another person walking through history. He is the master who controls history. And he's not just a man because, let's think about it. You show me a good man, and I can put another good man right next to him. However, no one compares with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one and only Savior. If Jesus Christ came to this building, came into your house, we would all fall down on our, on our faces and worship him. For he's not just a man. Something else Gamaliel does. He recommends a false criterion. His criterion is a success is the measure of the movement. If it is successful, then it is of God. Now that's not necessarily true. Because if that is true, then Islam is of God. If all you do is just count noses and that proves to you whether God is in something or not, you don't understand the New Testament Gospels. You don't understand the New Testament church. You see, the majority is not always right. In 1842, the first bathtub 
was made. It literally caused a furor in American newspapers. They wrote article after article condemning it. Doctors warned that this bathtub could be detrimental to your health if you used it. Boston, which was sophisticated at that time, they banned bathtubs. In Virginia, if you bought a bathtub, you were fined $30. But you see, the majority is not always right. Success in time is not the criteria. When you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, if you measure the ministry of Jesus Christ by success in time, then he was a failure. He was brought up in a little town called Nazareth. He had a few disciples who literally disappointed him in every turn. He died alone on a cross. They buried him in a tomb. No, he did not have success in time. But success in time is not the criteria. I mean, you know, we have celebrities today that every time they walk their dog, it makes the news. Yet we have today humble, little known Christians who are faithfully serving the Lord Jesus Christ. They are making an impact for God in this world. So it's not success in time that matters. It's success in eternity that matters. But he also suggested a false conclusion. What did he say? Gamaliel said, if it's not of God, it will come to naught. He's saying, let's just be a fence straddler. That's his conclusion. Hey, hey gang, let's, let's just wait and see. Aren't you glad that Paul did not take the advice of his teacher to wait and see how it turned out? Aren't you glad that these apostles didn't take the wait and see attitude? For you see, today Jesus Christ is no longer on trial. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is no longer on trial. It has faced the test of time and it has won. It will face the test of eternity and it will win. So don't be a fence straddler when it comes to Jesus Christ today. Do what the apostles did. They sang and they suffered and yet they were still soul winners. They wept and they rejoiced and yet they still preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. The last three verses of this chapter tell us these disciples just kept on preaching for Jesus. They took their stand with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where we need to be today. Yeah, it could be dangerous to join a church. The Bible says here about this church in Acts chapter 5, people were afraid to join the church. Don't just be a joiner. Get involved in the work of your church. Chapter 5 and verse 14, the Bible says believers were the more added to the Lord. Be a believer who tells people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only tells people about the Lord Jesus Christ, but be a believer who lives what they talk about. Once again, we want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Continue to pray for one another. Pray for the churches in our area that God would continue to bless. Thank you once again so much for your faithfulness and your giving. Just a couple of more days left in 2020. And I trust you will continue to remember the church in your faithfulness and your giving as well. Please remember once again that we will be online only this coming Sunday at 1030. Lord bless you. We love you and Happy New Year.